Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance and in this video we will cover tension curves for hypertrophy training and what implications this has for exercise selection. So what exactly is a tension curve? A tension curve, also referred to as a strength curve, is the amount of force that can be produced throughout the range of a particular lift. We can produce different amounts of force at different points in the lift during the same exercise. For example, let's use a chin-up to demonstrate this idea. A chin-up is naturally easiest at the bottom range and harder at the top of the lift. So clearly there is a different amount of force that can be produced at different ranges throughout the lift. So why do exercises have different tension curves? There are three main factors influencing the tension curves of each lift. The first factor which influences the tension curve throughout each lift is the external moment arm. This refers to the position of the load in space relative to the joint. To briefly summarize, longer moment arms make the lift harder, while shorter moment arms make the lift easier. For example, during a bicep curl, we can see that the load has a shorter moment arm at the top and bottom position of the lift, but a longer moment arm when the forearm is parallel with the ground. This means that more force is required to lift the load through the mid-range compared with the start and end of the lift. The second factor which influences tension curves is the internal moment arm. This refers to the position of the muscle attachment relative to the joint. At different portions of each lift, the internal moment arms change. To briefly summarize, when we have a longer internal moment arm, the lift becomes easier, and a shorter internal moment arm makes the lift harder. This is specific to the anatomy of each muscle and its attachment sites and can become quite a confusing topic. However, as a simple exercise, if we look at our bicep curl again, we can see that we have a longer internal moment arm between the biceps insertion and the elbow joint at mid-range and a shorter internal moment arm at the start and end of the lift. This means that the biceps are in a more favorable position to produce force during the mid-range compared with the start and end of the lift. The other factor that influences tension curves is the length tension relationship. This is a relationship between force production and overlap of the actin myosin cross bridging. Basically the relationship looks like this. When the muscle is in a fully shortened position, there is a lot of overlap of the actin and myosin filaments of the muscle fibers. This means that there are fewer sites for cross bridges to form and force production will be inhibited. When the muscle is at a moderate length, there is optimal overlap of the actin and myosin filaments. This means that a maximum amount of cross bridges can form and force production will be optimized. And when the muscle is at a lengthened position, there is minimal overlap of the actin and myosin filaments. This again reduces the opportunity for cross bridges to form and force production will be reduced. Therefore, the length of the muscle will influence its ability to produce force. So what tension curves do different movements have? Well, each exercise has a different tension curve based on the factors discussed. However, we can group exercises into general movement categories that all have similar tension curves. Pressing exercises generally have an ascending tension curve. This means that we are weaker at the start of the lift and stronger at the end of the lift. For example, during a bench press, we are weaker at the bottom portion and stronger at the top portion in lockout. Most standard pressing exercises naturally have this same tension curve. Pulling exercises usually have the opposite tension curve. They have a descending tension curve where the start of the lift is easiest and the end of the lift is hardest. For example, a seated cable row is easiest at the very start of the lift and becomes harder as the arms get closer to the body. Most standard pulling exercises naturally have this same tension curve. Squat and leg press variations generally have a bell-shaped tension curve. This means that the movement is easier at the bottom and top range of the lift, but more difficult midway through. For example, a deep high bar squat is easy at the top and very bottom, but it is hardest at the sticking point usually just above parallel. Most standard squat and leg press variations have this same tension curve. Hinge exercises don't have a generalizable tension curve. Different exercises will have different tension curves. When we compare a conventional deadlift to a sumo deadlift, to a stiff leg deadlift to a hip thrust, the tension curves of these exercises are all different. So there is no specific tension curve that we can group these exercises to, rather it is specific to the movement. Bicep curl variations generally have a bell-shaped tension curve like the squat. This means that the movement is easier at the start and end of the lift and harder during the mid-range. For example, a dumbbell curl is easy at the bottom of the lift, most difficult when the forearm is parallel with the ground and easier at the end range. So what impact do tension curves have on hypertrophy? The tension curve on the exercise can impact the hypertrophic stimulus of each rep. This is because the muscles can be more or less stressed through different portions of the range of motion. 
there are two primary considerations regarding the effects of tension curves on hypertrophy. First is the tension throughout the entire range of motion. This refers to how much stress is on the muscle throughout the entire repetition. Ideally, we want high tension throughout the entire range of motion so that the muscle requires more work to be performed at all joint angles. If we only have high tension at certain portions of the lift, then the muscle is only stressed at those particular points. Therefore, it may be beneficial to seek exercises which allow a more evenly distributed tension throughout the entire range of motion. The other consideration is tension in a stretched position. This refers to how much stress is placed on the muscle in a maximally stretched position. We ideally want a high degree of tension on the muscle in a stretched position, as this has some evidence to be more hypertrophic than contraction at a shortened position. Therefore, if there is variable tension throughout the lift, we ideally want to bias the stress to be higher when the muscle is in a stretched position. So what implications does this have for hypertrophy training? Well, we can potentially try to select exercises to make the loading more favorable for muscle growth. This means we can try to make the tension more constant throughout the range and ensure a high degree of tension in a stretched position. Some standard free weight exercises naturally match up well with the tension curves of certain movements, while others don't. For the exercises that don't work well, we can make slight adjustments to suit their specific tension curves. Here are two common examples of how we can modify exercises to best suit the tension curve of the exercise. The first and probably most notable example is horizontal rows. Horizontal rows have a descending tension curve, which means they are easier at the start of the lift and harder as the weight is brought closer to the body. This means that if we use a heavy load, we can't achieve a full range of motion with strict technique. And if we use a light load, the lift is only challenging at the end range. Therefore, we can select specific exercises to match the tension curve of the lift. In this case, an exercise like a landmine row or a T-bar row may be useful. This is because during these exercises, the weight is heavier at the start of the lift and easier as the weight is brought towards the body. This allows the start range to be loaded heavier and the end range to be loaded lighter. There are also some manufacturers that make machines to specifically match up with the tension curves of pulling exercises. And another example where the tension curve becomes relevant is during a chest fly. A standard dumbbell chest fly is hardest at the bottom range and easiest at the top range. This isn't a huge issue because the chest will be challenged in a stretched position rather than a shortened position. However, apart from the bottom position, the lift becomes quite easy at the top because gravity is only making the weight challenging in a vertical position, not a horizontal position. So when we try to horizontally flex the shoulders to squeeze the pecs at the top of the lift, there is almost no resistance. Therefore, we can probably use a more effective exercise to allow high tension on the pecs throughout the entire range. In this case, a cable fly or pec tech machine may be a better option. These exercises will allow high tension throughout the entire range of motion, including the end range. Thanks for watching, and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.